Hello everyone, it's Scott, and today we're going to look at some Marks of the Machine spoilers, and our focus today is going to be looking at the top transforming double face cards from the set. So, but before we get started, special thanks to Caffeinated Gamers for sponsoring our video series, and remember to like and subscribe to get further content like this in the near future. And we'll be going through some other top 10 list. We're going to look at the top 10 battles, top 10 just kind of general cards for standard that are not transforming. So we're going to look at a lot of different things over the next couple of days that I think are going to have standard relevance and then relevance potentially in other formats as well. So let's get started with number 10, Rona, Herald of Invasion. For one, in a blue mana, you get a legendary creature that's a human wizard. And when you cast a legendary creature, untap Rona, Herald of Invasion. So we've got this loop that you can create with Rona because she also has the ability to draw a card and then discard a card. So you tap her, you play her, next turn you tap, draw a card, and then you play a legendary creature. And now you're moving through your deck pretty quickly. And each time you do that, you're gonna be able to draw an additional card, discard a card, and move forward through your deck. So I think that in and of itself is a powerful ability within the Legends deck. And I expect Esper Legends to be a place where we find this in standard. And then if you transform Rona, then you get Rona Tolarian Obliterator, which is a legendary creature. It's a Fire and Rip Wizard. That's a 5-5. Five five. So that in and of itself, for the six mana that you're transforming into, that's a good, relatively good value. It has Trample as well. And then whenever a source deals damage to Rona, Tolarian Obliterator, that source's controller exiles a card from their hand at random. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield under your control. Otherwise, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. So I think if you get to the back side, that's a really powerful ability. Uh, basically, you Rona is, is, does attacks, they block it, and now you're looking through their hand. So that's a, a pretty powerful ability. But I think the selling point for me, at least, is the front side with that draw card, then discard a card. And I think this has application beyond standard as well. Where, where there are some Pioneer decks and some decks in Modern that might want this card as well. Next at number nine, we have Heliod the Radiant Dawn. For two and two white mana, you get legendary enchantment creature. That's a god. It's a 4-4. And when Heliod the Radiant Dawn enters the battlefield, return target enchantment card that isn't a god from your graveyard to your hand. So already in standard, we have all of the enchantment creatures from Kamigawa. So I think what we'll see is Heliod will go into any deck that's already using those cards. And, you know, even the mono white deck that's the mono white control deck is using several of those enchantments to get value. So I think Heliod kind of fits in there, but also we've had a Selesnia enchantment deck that has been around since Kamigawa. And I think it, it fits into there as well as a way to just recurse things from your graveyard. If you spend four mana, you can transform it. And then you get Heliod, the Warped Eclipse, and you may cast spells as though they have flash and spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card your opponents have drawn this turn. So I think that is going to be I think the real selling point in a lot of decks is basically what Heliod does is once you cast Heliod for the first time and transform it, then everything that you can do is now at flash speed. And that is a really powerful ability. So basically, you're taking your turn off, you're playing everything on their turn, and that in and of itself is a very, very powerful ability. So I think Heliod has not only standard playability, but Pioneer and Modern as well, because there are going to be decks that would love to just play on their opponent's turn. And we've seen decks like this in the past that are, that are good decks. So I think this is going to be a card that we'll definitely see play in standard. Next at number eight, we have Kenra Spell Spear for one and a red mana. You get a Jackal Warrior, that's a 2 2. It has Trample and Prowess. So I'm really interested in this card because we've already got Monastery Swift Spear in the format. And we're also going to be getting another white card that is very similar to this that has Prowess. So I think we, we might see a Boros prowess deck developed over the course of the the next year or so and i think this is going to be a really key card in that and my reasoning is this 
it has trample trample is a very powerful ability and when you're stringing spells together that are low cost getting trample onto a creature like Kenra spell spear is very powerful and if you have to, if you take a turn off you can't really do anything for a particular turn you can spend four mana then to transform it and then it has trample it has ward two it has prowess and prowess so it has double prowess on the backside. so i think that makes this a very very powerful spell because basically you cast a non-creature spell and you're getting two prowess triggers you still have the trample and also that ward two helps to protect it from removal from your opponents so i think this is definitely going to go into a boros shell for prowess and i think there's a lot of playability there and we've already kind of sort of got a mono red burn deck so i think this kind of fits in there as well as a good card to just continue to to ramp into things that are going to be more and more powerful as the game goes on all right at number seven i've got Jin taxes for three and two blue mana you get a legendary creature that's a phyrexian praetor that's a five five it has ward two and when you cast a non-creature spell with mana value three or greater draw a card so Jenga Taxus on the front side, I think is a fine magic card. It's got playability on its own, the ward to protect it. And then if you're casting larger spells like Memory Deluge or something like that in a blue deck, then you're going to get that added value of additional card draw, which I think is, is a nice ability. And then if you transform it, then you're going to get additional value so you exile jenga taxes and return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control but you can only deactivate it as a sorcery and only if you have seven or more cards in your hand so i think that's really the thing that i think is a limiting factor on jenga taxes overall ability is you've got to have seven cards in your hand at least to transform it and i think that'll create a limitation on it that will be a little bit hard for decks to overcome now on the back side if you are able to transform you get the great synthesis on chapter one you get to draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hand you have no maximum hand size for as long as you control the great synthesis and then on chapter two return all non-phyrexian creatures to their owner's hands and then on chapter three you may cast spells any number of spells from your hand without paying their mana cost, exile the great synthesis, then return it to the battlefield. So if you can get to the backside, it's very powerful ability. So you're it's saying draw seven at least. So for four mana, you draw seven. And then on the second chapter of it, then your opponent is going to have to get have to basically clear their board of creatures because we're not seeing a lot of phyrexian creatures right now in standard so i think that in of itself is powerful and certainly as you go to older formats like pioneer and modern that's a really powerful ability because only current cards in standard have the phyrexian label on them or creature type on them so the result of that is any older phyrexians that you might have they are not going to be able to stay on the board either if your opponent's playing one of those and then again being able to cast all of your spells for free if you can't win under those circumstances then you just don't have a really good deck because you're you're going to be able to cast upwards of 10 spells for free and i think that's just a, an amazing ability but again my one concern about the card is you have to have seven or more cards in your hand so you're going to have to have a lot of card draw spells that are going to be required to keep you at high uh, at a high card total so i think that's the limitation and that's why i rate this as the least powerful of the creators now at number six we've got voren clex for three and two green mana you get a legendary creature that's a phyrexian praetor that's a six six it has trample and reach and when voren clex enters the battlefield search your library for up to two forest cards reveal them put them in your hand then shuffle so with the additional forest draw basically you get from the card it, it's going to be easy to ramp into Vorinclex's ability to transform because you need eight total mana to do that and you're going to exile Vorinclex and return it to the battlefield transform under its owner's control again activate only as a sorcery and then you get the great evolution on 
chapter one, you mill 10 cards, then put two, up to two creature cards from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. On chapter two, you get to distribute seven plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures you control. And then on chapter three, until end of turn, creatures you control gain one. This creature fights target creature you don't control. Exile the, the grand evolution, then return it to the battlefield. So I, so there are powerful abilities here and the ability to kind of, you know, for first eight mana, you're immediately getting two creatures onto the battlefield, which I think is a fine ability. And then you get to distribute those seven plus one plus one counters on chapter two. So that's going to be a powerful ability, making all of your creatures larger and more difficult to block or trade in combat. And then on chapter three, basically what you're going to be able to do is spend your mana, knock out their creatures, and then attack through hopefully to win the game on chapter three, when you hit chapter three. Now, overall, I think Jenga Taxus's enchantment, his saga is better, but Vorinclex's ability to transform doesn't require anything specific other than having eight mana. And that's why I think it's a better card overall than Jenga Taxus. All right, looking at number five, we've got... Ayara, Widow of the Realm, for one and two black mana. You get an Elf Noble. That's a 3-3. Three, three. And then you can tap Ayara and sacrifice another creature or artifact. And Ayara, Widow of the Realm, deals X damage to target opponent or battle. And you gain X life, or X is the sacrifice permanent's mana value. So that ability is a very powerful ability coming in here at number five on our list. Because you're, you're going to be able to sacrifice things pretty easily and we've already got a sacrifice deck in Rakdos colors with the owner called anvil so the ability to go ahead and sacrifice things and then again either hit them or a battle i think is a really good ability and the ability to do that is going to then fill your graveyard with creatures hopefully that you will then when you transform iara for six mana then you get ir furnace queen and this is a legend creature it's a phyrexian elf noble that's a four four and then at the beginning of combat on your turn return up to one target artifact or creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield it gains haste and exile it at the beginning of the next end step so for every, every time you've burned your opponent basically okay and again it's based on the mana value of that permanent you're going to be able to then, after you transform IR, you're going to be able to replay those cards, give them haste, and they can trample through or attack your opponent. So there's a lot of value there. And if if you have IR Furnace Queen on the field and IR Widow of the Realm, at the beginning of combat, you bring a card back and then before it exiles at the beginning of the next end step you can then sacrifice it again to Iara and create the continue the loop so i think this is a, a really powerful card it's just going to be finding the exact right shell for it but i think this is going to be a powerful card in standard and in his you know in pioneer and in modern we have these kind of decks these sack decks aristocrat decks that are out there so i think iara fits in there as well as a card that's just going to help facilitate that game plan all right moving on to number four we have pelucranos reborn for three green mana you get a legendary creature that's a hydra it's a four or five and it has reach so three mana four or five reach good card on its own okay so this, I think, immediately will will slot into a mono green deck or a, a, a deck that's heavily green. And then when you transform it for seven mana, you get Pelucranos Engine of Ruin. It's a legendary creature. It's Phyrexian Hydra. That's a 6-6. Six, six. It has reach, and it also has lifelink. And when Pelucranos Engine of Ruin or another non-token Hydra you control dives... You create a 3-3 green and white Phyrexian Hydra creature token with reach and a 3-3 green and white Phyrexian Hydra creature token with lifelink. So basically, 
if Pelucranos dies or another Hydra you control dies, it's going to replace itself with two 3-3s, three one with Lifelink and one with Reach. So if you can get it to the backside, you're getting a tremendous amount of value. And this really reminds me of Worm Coil Engine. That's a staple, some of the decks in Modern. And because of that, that ability to you know, generate creatures when you're leaving the battlefield, it's very powerful and it's difficult to work around that. So I think this has definite standard playability, but I think in mono green devotion decks and other kind of decks, this is definitely something that is going to see play in those decks, particularly I think in Pioneer, because we've already got a very strong mono green devotion deck. And I think this just slots right into that deck at this point. At number three, we have Shialdred for three and two black mana. You get a legendary creature that's a Phyrexian Praetor. That's a four or five. It has menace. And when Shialdred enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a non-token creature or planeswalker. So this is why I have Shialdred above some of the other Praetors that we've seen so far. Because that ability to, for, for basically five mana, you get you obviously get a 4-4 four, four body with Menace, but then you also get to take out a creature or a Planeswalker at that point. And typically we're seeing that to be two th or three mana, the cost of getting rid of something. So the result of that is, really, if you think about it, really Shialdred, even though you're casting it for five, you're getting seven or eight mana's worth of value out of Shialdred when you cast it. And then when you transform Shialdred, okay, and you can only activate again as a sorcery and only if an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, then you get the true scriptures. And on chapter one, each for each opponent, destroy up to one target creature or planeswalker that player controls. So immediately once you transform it, you're immediately taking out their biggest creature or best planeswalker. On chapter two, each opponent mills three cards, then mill or discards three cards, then mills three cards. So you're basically you're disrupting their hand and you're putting more cards in the graveyard. And then on chapter three, put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control, exile the true scriptures, then return it to the battlefield. So when you when it transforms on chapter three, A, you're gonna get all the creatures that are available in both graveyards from a standard perspective. And you're gonna put those on your side. And then when you transform it back to Shialdred, you get to, again, force your opponent to sacrifice a non-token creature or a planeswalker, which is a backbreaking ability um, when, when that occurs. Again, the limitation, I think, on Shialdred here is you've got to have eight or more cards in your opponent's graveyard. So I think what you're to get Shialdred to work really well, you're going to have to have a, a way to get cards in your opponent's graveyard. So whether it's through Mill or something else. So I can see... Shialdred and the, the new Jace working well together because it's forcing your opponent to, to mill cards every turn if you want to. And the, the consequence of that is by the time you get to Shialdred, they're likely to have almost enough cards to transform Shialdred. And I think that's going to be where we're, where Shialdred is going to shine in the format. And again, getting the ability to bring all of the creatures from all graveyards back is just a backbreaking ability for any opponent. At number two, we have Elish Norn for two and two white mana. You get a legendary creature that's a Phyrexian Praetor with Vigilance, and whenever a source an opponent controls deals damage to you or a permanent you control, that source's controller loses two life unless they pay one. So let's not even worry about the backside yet. Um, Elish Noir as a 3-5 with Vigilance, good card on its own. And then this ability to, in essence, ping your opponent when they do damage to you is a very powerful ability. Typically, this is something we tend to see more on black cards, but I think this is a fine magic card that's got a place in standard because of that ability. Every time your opponent hits you, then they lose two life. And I think that, in and of itself makes Elishnorn a very playable card. And then when you you can transform it by sacrificing three other creatures, okay, Elishnorn under those circumstances, and then you can get the Argent etchings, 
Now in chapter one, you get to incubate two, five times and transform all incubator tokens you control. So I think where Elish Norn probably is going to shine is in a dedicated Phyrexian deck where you're already doing things that are going to create incubator tokens throughout the course of the game. You flip Shialdr Elish Norn for that three mana. And then once you do that, then you're going to have all kinds of two, two Phyrexian creatures or other kinds of Phyrexian creatures as well. And then on chapter two, creatures you control get plus one, plus one and gain double strike until end of the turn. And then on chapter three, you destroy all other permanents except for artifacts, lands, and Phyrexians, exile the Argent etchings, then return it to the battlefield. So the, the really nice thing about Elish Norn here is you're gonna be able to loop this because you're creating five incubator tokens when you transform Elish Norn. So you know you're going to have creatures that you can sacrifice. And I can see Elish Norn working incredibly well with the Skrelf's Hive and Mondrake, where you're creating extra tokens. So this is incubate, you know, two for five, five times. Well, with Mondrake in play, that's going to be a additional copies of those as well so i think there's really a lot of synergy in phyrexians that we're going to see in standard and i and I'm, I'm expecting there to be a dedicated phyrexian deck it's just figuring out what's going to go at the low end of it because you've got high-end cards like elish norn shialdred that are, are very very powerful cards in the format and our number one card in my mind for the transforming double face cards is Urabrask for two and two red mana. You get a legendary creature that's a Phyrexian Praetor. It has first strike. It's a 4-4. And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Urabrask deals one damage to target opponent and adds one mana. So my place for this card is in a dedicated Is It Spells deck where you're hopefully getting you know Urabrask out on turn four or turn five and having mana available and if you do have mana available and you've got low cost spells that you can cast to go ahead and transform it that's going to be really key to the success of Urabras because you can pay one mana and exile it as long as you've played three or more instants and or sorcery spells this turn you're going to be able to do that. And I think that in and of itself makes Urabrask really powerful. We've had the Is It Phoenix deck around for a long time. And that deck, when we originally got the, the Phoenix, well, you know, it's not going to be all that great. It's going to be problematic. Well, it wasn't problematic to get to the three spells in a turn. In fact, it was pretty easy to get to three spells in a turn and do that fairly quickly. And I think because of that, the ease at which you're going to be able to transform Shialdra or Urabrask here is really powerful. So when you transform it, you get the great work. And on chapter one, the great work deals three damage to each opponent and each creature that they control. So from a standard perspective, your opponent, it does three damage to them and each of their creatures. So that's going to wipe the board in a lot of cases by doing that. And it's a one-way board wipe. It's only their creature. So if you've got a Monastery Swiss Spear or some other cards in play, because prowess is a thing, when we talked about um, the Kenra Spell Spear earlier, so I think Urabrask fits into the deck with them potentially as well, because if you're going to be spell slinging anyways, this is a great card in that, and you're just going to be able to you know keep going. And the result of that is that you're going to be able to transform this pretty quickly. Now, the one thing that I don't like is the chapter two a whole lot because it's just create three treasure tokens. But again, that can help you flip Urabrask again if you need to. And then on chapter three, until end of turn, you may cast instant and sorcery spells from any graveyard. If a spell cast this way would be put into a graveyard, ex exile it instead, then exile the great work and then return it to the battlefield. So from that standpoint, I mean, I think the ability to recast everything that you've cast is a cr incredibly powerful. And again, you, Urabras is gonna transform, so that means every time you cast one of those spells, you're gonna get an additional red mana. And the result of that is you're going to be able to very quickly continue to ping your opponent and replay spell after spell after spell. 
And the result of that is any prowess creatures are going to be huge that you have. And then you're most likely going to be able then to string at least three spells together and then transform Urbrask again. So you're going to do three damage to your opponent. You're going to do three damage to all of their creatures. And this this is one of the cards. You know, I talked about Elish Norn looping. Urbrask is going to loop constantly. You could probably do, you're going to be able to loop this. And if, if we can find a way to go ahead and proliferate where you're able to proliferate and then do chapter one and get to chapter two on the turn of Urabrask comes into play. That's powerful because then you're going to get those treasure tokens, give you some more mana to use. And then if you can proliferate a second time, then you're going to be able to go now into all of your graveyards. And then again, it's going to repeat the, that particular loop. So I think this is an incredibly powerful card. I can't wait to really dig into getting this to be a successful card. And I think Urabrask honestly has let you know standard playability pioneer playability and even modern playability because we do have decks that are going to do these things and i can even see this you know in a mono red burn deck as a way to continue to do ping damage and then as a top end card and then you go off and go ahead and you know continue to do those additional points of damage and then you flip it it ruins your your opponent's side of the board and then your prowess creatures are, or in your creatures are going to be attacked through and hopefully finish off your opponent all right so those are the transforming double face cards that i think are the best that we've got from march of the machine i think generally speaking all of them are very playable in standard and i really like the paraders as a general series of cards because i think they're all potentially playable in standard now we i don't expect all of them to immediately see play once you know we we get the set in a, in a week or so but over the course of time i think all of them are going to have standard relevance and be seen in some kind of deck in standard all right so thanks for watching our video all the way to the end and remember to like and subscribe and we'll be back with more march the machine list when we're, we're going to be talking about battles and we'll also be talking about the top 10 regular cards for standard thanks for watching I'll see you next time.